when we're talking mm. about calm, we're talking about the state of our nervous system. When we're talking about quiet, we're talking about sitting still and having a shut mouth. And yes, screen time does make children quiet, but is it, it is extremely stimulating to our nervous system. And that's why we generally see children having these big behaviors when we take away the tablet or we turn off the TV. Welcome to the Healthy Screen Habits Podcast. I'm Hillary Wilkinson. Whether you're starting your parenting journey with a newborn or looking to connect with your teen on technology, let's learn some new healthy screen habits together. I am a big believer in the concept of bridging as introduced by Gene Rogers in episode 12 of season two and Temple Grandin in episode six of season one. Those will be linked in the show notes. <laughs> this is that concept of sparking interest online and bridging it to an outdoor activity. For example, like finding paper airplane designs online and then go build them and fly them outside research insects in your area, and then go on a bug hunt. So today's guest knows all about the curiosity and wonder of early childhood. As parenting coach and CEO of Uncommon Sense Parenting, she's also the host of the Mudroom podcast and a registered early childhood educator. Alana Robinson supports parents of toddlers, preschoolers, and kindergartners in understanding why their children are misbehaving and how to fix it without yelling, shaming, or timeouts. I love this very peaceful approach to early childhood. Welcome to the Healthy Screen Habits podcast, Alana Robinson. Thank you so much for having me. So Alana, I'm interested to hear a little bit about your background. How did you get started in this kind of parent coaching space? Yeah, so I was an early interventionist in Edmonton, Alberta for about 10-ish years um, prior to moving into parent coaching. And I worked with every stripe of kiddo that you can think of, all the way from completely typical run-of-the-mill speech delay up to one of my clients is one of three children in North America with their specific diagnosis. So I have run the gamut. There's very little that children can do that surprises me anymore. <laughs> And I loved it. I absolutely adored it. Um, but when I got pregnant with my oldest son, um, I was having some physical difficulties keeping up with these very high needs kids. And I rolled over into a parent coaching role and I loved it. I thought I was going to hate it, but I loved it. And I could see how big of an impact it had when parents understood what was going on with their kids and the gains that their children made when the parents were continuing using the strategies that their children were learning in therapy in the home. And so I kept doing that while I was on maternity leave remotely and my husband's in the Canadian forces and we got posted right after my maternity leave ended to what I affectionately call the middle of nowhere. <laughs> and so where we currently live is extremely rural. There are very few services. There are no jobs. And so I was kind of bored out of my mind. And I decided to just keep up with this remote parent coaching gig that I had started while I was on maternity leave. And things kind of snowballed from there. Um, after about a year, I was burning out, though, because I had a huge wait list of parents and not enough time in the day to actually care for them. And so we very slowly rolled it over into a group coaching program, tested it out a little bit. And for the last six years, that's what we've been running is a group coaching program for parents who are at their end of the rope with their children's behavior. Wow. So you were pre pandemic in your remote yeah, coaching. So this was. was like nothing but a thing for you. Very yeah, well, it was I was very fortunate when the pandemic hit, we were able to just expand and welcome in all these parents who were now stuck at home with their kids. And you know, the pandemic, if nothing else, when you're stuck at home with your children, it really highlights the um, behaviors that maybe were flying under the radar before <laughs> while they were at daycare and preschool. So Sure. Um, we were very fortunate to be able to support thousands of parents during this 
So Uncommon Sense's mission is to empower parents as the expert on their own child and create an inclusive world full of calm, competent, confident kids. I like how this puts the parent in the expert seat, but I can imagine also that it feels foreign to parents who maybe have never worked with kids prior to having their own. So how, I just can imagine kind of the challenges. How do you coach? people into sort of feeling that role of expertise? I approach everything from a developmental standpoint. I want parents to understand child development, how their child's brain is working and developing, and the different challenges that come up along the way, because I find it makes parents way more empathetic when they understand what's going on under the hood, so to speak. When you understand why your child is behaving the way that they behave, it's a lot easier to pick appropriate tactics and strategies. And when you pick appropriate tactics and strategies, you generally get the outcome that you're looking for. So we focus entirely on educating parents on child development and helping them take that theoretical knowledge and actually implement it into everyday strategies so that when something's going on, they can accurately diagnose it and take appropriate action. It completely holds hands with our mission at Healthy Screen Habits, which is educating and empowering families to create their own healthiest screen habits. But um, I do believe that education, I, I we share a background in education, so I, it doesn't doesn't surprise me that we're <laughs> that we're aligned. Okay. Another thing that I love about your philosophy is it seems to kind of focus on balance, and this is really tricky when dealing with tech. We know that apps and games are not designed to allow for self-regulation. They're designed to keep and hold user Mm -hmm. attention. Really tricky when you're dealing with the immature brains as well as, but I mean, to use immature, it sounds negative. I'm not meaning that they're immature by design. I mean, they're developmentally appropriate brains as well as any of our neurodiverse population. So how do you recommend we balance this overstimulation our kids get when using tech? So I teach my clients to bookend screen time with regulation activities. And regulation or activities are those activities that really fulfill your child's sensory needs and put them into that state of flow. Um, a lot of parents will say to me when we first start working together, well, the only time that they're calm is when they're watching TV. Uh And it's because parents have conflated this concept of quiet and calm. When we're Mm. talking about calm, we're talking about the state of our nervous system. When we're talking about quiet, we're talking about sitting still and having a shut mouth. And yes, screen time does make children quiet, but it it is extremely stimulating to our nervous system. And that's why we generally see children having these big behaviors when we take away the tablet or we turn off the TV. Right. So to counteract that, I always recommend to my clients that they bookend that time with activities that provide their children with the kind of sensory input that their child finds regulating. So, you know, I'll use my own children as an example. My youngest loves to run. It is his preferred activity. If he is bored out of his mind, you're going to find him running to the point where he usually does at least two 5Ks a day. Oh, wow. So <laughs> yeah, he loves running. So if he wants to be on his tablet, if he's going to be watching TV, that's fine. But hey, buddy, can you go for a run first? And it doesn't have to be a 5K run, but he's going to take 10 minutes and he's either going to run around our yard or he's going to run around our block. And then he's going to come back. He's going to do his screen time. When the tablet goes away, hey, why don't you go for a quick run? And then we're going to move on to the next thing. So I make sure that he's getting that sensory input before and after to re-regulate his nervous system after he's engaged with screens. Because if I don't, he's just a pain in the ass. (laughs) Well, and the thing I really like about that also is you, um, by, by teaching them how to do that, as they get older, they're also going to independently strive for that yes. regulation and that balance, which is what exactly. you want to set up for it's long-term a habit. success. Exactly. Right. Like we're oh. talking about screen time habits and 
the more children are used to being regulated, the more they're going to strive to remain regulated. The more used they are to being dysregulated, the more that's going to feel normal to them. And they're going to have the opposite reaction when they get regulated. They're going to try to hyper arouse themselves again because feeling regulated feels dangerous and different. Right. So we want to create that habit of regulation for our children. Right. Because, well, although in our teen years, the feeling dangerous and different leads to an excitement as a child, feeling dangerous and different is a point of uncomfortability. Well, and it creates those big behaviors, right? Because if we're looking at like um, children using their limbic system and being in that defense mode, being very, very emotional and irrational, when they're feeling, when they're using their limbic system primarily, they can't learn right? That's not where learning happens in the brain. It actually blocks learning because if we don't have enough energy, we'll stop sending resources to it, which means that we can't use our language. We can't use our executive functioning skills. We can't use our learning, our reasoning skills. Like none of that is functioning. So we're just operating with emotions, memories, safety, and instinct (laughs) and intuition. So if children are hyper aroused, if they're not calm, they can't learn. Right. And when, so then we see parents trying to reason with these kids, especially, you know, I've been in so many restaurants, airports where the parents trying to take away the screen time and the child's like freaking out. The parents are trying to reason with them. Like, it's okay. You can have it back when we get home or when, after we get on the plane and the kid's freaking out they can't hear you, (laughs) they can't understand what you're saying because the part of their brain that processes reason physically isn't getting any resources. Turned off, right. Exactly, it's disconnected. Mm -hmm. So again, with understanding what's going on underneath the hood, if you know that your child is dysregulated and that screen time is going to dysregulate them, you can plan for that. Mm -hmm. And it makes having those behavior conversations and interventions just so much easier. Excellent. So we have to take a break. But when we come back, I'm going to ask Alana for more of these fantastic parenting tips on keeping boundaries around screen time. We love what we do and we wouldn't be able to do it without the generous donations provided by our listeners and followers. We want to extend special thanks to the Doctors Petty for their unwavering support of the podcast and organization. If you'd like to make a difference and contribute to the education and empowerment of families building their healthiest screen habits, please go to healthyscreenhabits.org, find the Take Action tab, and scroll down and click the Donate button. 100% of your donation will be used to spread awareness and bring families the tools they need to develop healthy screen habits. My guest is Alana Robinson. She's a mom of two and a military wife. She also hosts The Mud Room, which is a parenting podcast that delivers these great little nuggets of advice to parents of toddlers, preschoolers, and kindergartners on how to set your family up for success. I kind of view it like the mud room to your house. So, you know, the mud room of your house helps set you up for maintaining your sanity in your home. And that's, I love the name of your podcast. So, Alana, I have have to tell you anytime I'm having a difficulty with the maintenance of sanity in my own home, if I can do what you were just talking about before the break of clicking into the understanding of those developmental stages, it helps me kind of maintain objectivity and not get pulled down the rabbit hole. It's kind of like what you were talking about, about that peeking under the hood. I love that analogy. So with your background, you clearly really get brain development. And um, I'm kind of wondering, so when we are parenting <laughs> our children with tech, we often experience this sort of what I'm just going to call like tech defiance mm-hmm. or stalling or the best best of all for me is like blatant ignoring yes. <laughs> family boundaries. And what sorts of tips or techniques can you recommend that would set us up for success in managing this? Absolutely. So the first thing would be to create predictability and consistency around your screen time. So I always say to my clients, schedule it into your day and try as much as possible, like life happens, but 
as much as possible, try to have screen time at a predictable time of day for your children. And so I usually recommend using like a visual schedule for young kids because they can't read yet. So they just need a series of pictures to tell them what's gonna happen throughout the day. And one of those things is when you're gonna get your tablet or when you get to watch TV. And so like my children know that if they're home after lunch, that is screen time. Don't ask mom before that. Don't ask mom after that. After lunch is when you get to go get your tablet, you get to go turn on the TV. And that frees them up from trying to use those self-monitoring skills because often you'll hear them like badgering you. Like, can I have it now? Can I have it now? Can I have it now? And you're like, no, 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 no. I told you. <laughs> if it's at a predictable and consistent time of day, then that becomes routine. And routines really help children to feel safe and in control. They give that nice firm boundary that they know they can badger you all they want. But after a while, they're like, mm, this is never going to produce a different outcome. So they just stop. <laughs> and so creating that predictability and consistency is really, really important. Um, using visuals to help them see how much time they have. Um, I know that your viewers can't see me right now, but you can see behind me, I have a visual timer. Mm -hmm. And so this is like a little timer that when you set it, the time shows up in a different color. And then as the time goes away, the color gets smaller. And this really works with children's natural tendency to conflate quantity and size. There's several studies that have been done with young kids where, you know, if you get six cookies, and you give them a stack of three cookies or you set out the other three in a line. Toddlers, preschoolers, kindergartners will also almost universally choose the stack of cookies over the three set out next to each other because in their mind, the stack is bigger and therefore there are more cookies in that stack. So the visual timer works really well with that natural tendency to conflate quantity and size because the more color showing, the more time they have, the less color showing, the less time they have. And again, it frees them up from you monitoring them because right when you're in something and you're enjoying it, you're in that state of flow, five seconds, five minutes feels like five seconds. Sure. Right. Like, I uh, think we all, yeah, I mean, <laughs> we've all the, been there the, where the you're phrase, really enjoying something. Right. The phrase time flies when you're having fun exists for exactly. a reason. Exactly. Yeah. So when you say to your child, hey, you have five more minutes with the tablet and then we're putting it away, they go into their little state of flow and then it feels like you turn around and immediately go, okay, time's up, turn it off. And they're like, hell, you just said I had five minutes. Whereas with the visual timer, they can see the five minutes. They can look up and reference it to see that time getting smaller and smaller. So when you say, okay, time's up, it doesn't feel like it's gone by in a blink and they actually see the passage of time rather than just having to monitor it. So create that trust between you and your child that you're not just randomly going to take it away from them. And even if that's not your MO, you've never done that. It can feel that way a lot of times to young kids because time is so abstract. Right. Right. I love that. Um, so you held up this visual timer that I don't know that everybody would be able to uh, visualize. Yeah. Um, is there a brand that you Yeah, like this just is called a, a time timer. Time um, timer. Okay. They I'll come put, in all we'll different kinds of lengths. This one's a two hour one. They come in a five minute one, a 20 minute one, which I find really useful for screen time, a one hour one and a two hour one. Okay, excellent. I will... Um, make sure to include a link to those yeah. in our show notes so that if people want to ab adopt that amazing tip, we will uh, definitely have that for them. <laughs> so let's talk about the importance of play as an mm -hmm. early educator, early childhood development person, early childhood educator. We cannot say it again and again that play is the work of childhood. Yep. And so many times when I see my kids completely absorbed in digital modes of play, I have this fear that they're going to be missing out on the importance of dramatic play or imaginative play acting. Mm -hmm. And what are your thoughts on this sort of like digital versus, I'm going to call it analog play? Mm -hmm. 
well, they both have their place, right? I find that children, like you were saying in your introduction, really use that kind of information that they get from their digital play and they pull it into their analog play as long as they have the time and the space available to them. And so creating those um, provocations to bring that in. And oftentimes, like you'll see it by, you know, if they're really into Spider-Man and they've been watching a lot of Spider-Man cartoons, getting them a Spider-Man costume so that they can be Spider-Man. Oh, <laughs> or, sure. Or hanging a rope on a tree. And... Exactly. Kind of creating those provocations to pull what they're doing in their digital life into the real world. And again, creating that time and space in your schedule, in your routine, so that they have the chance to figure that out. I find a lot of parents, they're very impatient because children get into digital play very quickly. They expect them to do the same with their analog play. But the research shows that on average, it takes children an hour to really get into play. And that's a long time. A lot of parents just give their child an hour. And when their child hasn't settled into a game in that time, they're like, well, guess it's not going to happen. And they give up. I so <laughs> relate to that from thinking about like play dates that yeah. have been scheduled on my very adult schedule, you know, but we'd set a play date. And honestly, it would be like, you just feel like it was like the kids had done like a lot of parallel play or a lot of just kind of like feeling stuff out that last 10 minutes, they'd seem to like completely click and we're like, oh, and we have to go. And so, exactly. you know, so shame on me for not scheduling maybe two hours at the park. Exactly. And I mean, kids do it digitally too. Parents just don't realize it because their children are flitting between a bunch of different apps, but it's not as visual or as visible as them flitting between a whole bunch of different toys. And so making sure that you give your children nice chunky time to get into their analog play and really settle into their analog play and create some like yes space around that. Because when you think about children on tablets, typically we either have them locked in using guided access or they're using something like an Amazon tablet that has like a safe children's mode to it. And so they have that kind of like digital fence that they're allowed to explore within. But in analog play, we tend to have children in environments where they can break things. They don't have free run of the environment. They aren't allowed to just run around and explore and figure it out on their own. We're constantly saying, be careful, don't do that. Oh, don't touch that, that's not a toy. And so when we're thinking about setting up our analog fence <laughs> to give them that space to really explore, making sure that our environment that we're placing them in has that safety built into it, that it's set up for their success so that we're not constantly having to stick our nose in and break their play state. We're able to just let them figure it out. Yeah, yeah, no, and I love that. And kind of bringing that around so that maybe adults understand that play state that you're talking about yeah. is think about how irritating it is when you are in a work state of maybe you're creating a spreadsheet or doing something online or you're in that you know, quasi creative <laughs> state of your own work. If you have someone who keeps coming in and, you know, mom, 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 you know, that's why we lose our temper. We well, and you think about you the pandemic, that's what moms were complaining about, right? Like we had, it's not necessarily that we didn't have the time to work. It's that we didn't have the uninterrupted time to work and where we were, you know, trying to get things done. And every five seconds, somebody's coming in and asking for a goldfish cracker. And so it's the same thing with kids. If we're constantly sticking our nose in and giving them directions when they're trying to get into a game, they're never going to be able to get into that game because then they become preoccupied with what we're telling them to do. Right, right. And when we talk about game, just to be clear, we're talking about an imaginative, an offline type game. We're talking yeah, about- exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, dramatic play playing in the kitchen playing in the with their toys kind of game yeah. right right so knowing that you're the queen of developmental appropriateness what would be your number one developmental tool that you recommend outdoor unsupervised play oh i love it 
especially and, in this theme of outdoor living and experiencing yeah. nature. Please expand. <laughs> yeah, so outside is a perfectly balanced sensory environment. Remember how I was saying like our children need that sensory input because part of the quote unquote problem with screens is that it keeps our children very still and indoors where there isn't a whole lot of sensory stimulation, which our nervous system needs in order to develop appropriately. So outside is this perfectly balanced sensory environment. There isn't too much or too little input. It's very, very open-ended, right? You've got sticks and rocks and grass, and there's no like right or wrong way to play outside. So it gives children a lot of freedom. It gives them a perfect environment to regulate in. And it provides, because usually we have some nice wide open spaces, lots of opportunities to use our big muscles to take deep, very cleansing breaths and really engage our vagal tone. And all of these things are extremely important to developing a well-balanced and resilient nervous system. Wonderful. So we have to take a short break. But when we come back, I'm going to ask Alana Robinson for her healthy screen habit. Hi, I'm Amy Adams from Healthy Screen Habits. I have the privilege of running book club. And we invite you to join us each Friday over on Instagram at Healthy Screen Habits, where we discuss books that will help us create healthy screen habits for a balanced life. We have um, a book that we do every couple months, and we hope you'll join us and enjoy and learn and grow with us. My guest today is Alana Robinson, early childhood educator and developmental specialist who advocates for balance around digital wellness. Now, Alana, on every episode of the Healthy Screen Habits podcast, I ask each guest for a healthy screen habit, which is a tip or takeaway our listeners can put into practice in their own home. Do you have one you can share with us today? I think my top one would be to really use those visual timers and really make that time that your child has on screens concrete. Um, whether you use a physical timer, like a time timer or time timer actually has an app that you can on most tablets, Android and iOS, I'm not sure about Amazon, um, that you can actually like minimize into the corner of the screen. So the timer's right there for your child to see. Again, it makes that screen time concrete. It frees you up from having to monitor your child so they don't feel like you're hovering over their shoulder, just waiting to rip it out of their hands. And it gives them some independence around it, right? Like in our house, the rule is if you're not responsible enough to put it down, you're not responsible enough to pick it up. So my children know that when they hear the timer go off, that that means they need to put it down or else they're not going to have the opportunity to pick it back up at another time. Right. And that expectation where they can see the time that's allotted to them, they can see that time passing has completely eliminated any kind of resistance or um, fight back over screen time limits. Love it. Firm, fair, loving boundaries. That's yeah. You know, exactly. we, all, we all have to use them. So it's a great place to well, try They make out. our children feel safe, right? When we look at children and those big behaviors, it's almost always because there's an inconsistent boundary. Mm -hmm. And so the more consistent we can be with those boundaries, the safer our children feel and the less pushback you're going to experience. Right. So if our listeners would like to listen to more of Alana's wisdom, which I'm sure you're going to want to, you can find it at the Mudroom podcast or take a look at the Uncommon Sense Parenting website at alanarobinson.com. It's Alana with two L's and one N. And as always, I will link all of that information. If you can't remember the spelling, I will link all of the information in the show notes. And truly, Alana, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with me today. Alana Thank you mentioned so much for having me. <laughs> Alana mentioned she's actually the opposite of, you know, enjoying springtime weather. She's in the middle of an ice storm. So I'm like, sure oh my are. gosh. <laughs> oh, hang in there. <laughs> Thank you again for, for meeting with me today. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. 
For more information, you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at Healthy Screen Habits. Make sure to visit our website, healthyscreenhabits.org, where you can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. It's free, it's fun, and you get a healthy new screen habit each week. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate you giving us a quick rating. It really does help other people find us and spread the word of healthy screen habits. Or if you'd simply like to tell a friend, we'd love that too. I so appreciate you spending your time with me this week, and I look forward to learning more healthy habits together.